good. Welcome back. Hope you had some uh, great workshops. Some of you got a tan, I can see. That's only, that's only great. Uh, now it's, uh, it's, it's pitching time. After you spent so your energy in the, in the workshops, we're obviously very sort of excited to hear what are your sort of brilliant ideas that you want to upload on the platform for the Conference Future of Europe. Um, we have a panel up here. Uh, we have one person missing. Uh, this, is, this follows the M principle. So basically, we only have people starting with an M. This also goes for Morten Løkkegaard, who will sit next to, to Martin Ruby. Morten Løkkegaard is, is member of the European Parliament of the Renew Group. Um, we have Mikkel Winter also starting with an M from Critique Digital. And uh, Martin Ruby, I didn't say where he comes from. He comes from Meta head of public policy for Benelux and the Nordic region. And just before I basically uh, describe the rules, we have agreed just to, that you say a few words about yourself and your affiliation. So what is Critique Digital and who are you? <laughs> Thank you, and very short about that. My name is uh, Mikkel Winter, and uh, I am the leader of a youth-led movement called Kritik Digital. Kritik Digital. Yeah, we have to, you know, figure out how to say that very smoothly in English also. But, so we work to digitally empower young people and people in general in the digital world to be a part of the, uh, our democracy. Um, and that's the one, my, my one uh, experience. The other is that I'm, I'm uh, also a high school lehrer, a folk high school teacher at Kroge Post school where I have a subject called the digital mennesket, the digital human being for seven years. So uh, that's my two-part as association. Perfect. Thank you. Well, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm uh, Martin Ruby or Ruby. Um, I'm uh, working for Meta, which uh, you probably better know as Facebook. So uh, Meta has, uh, is the company that has Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp. And uh, I'm the uh, Nordic uh, head of policy. Uh, so, and head of policy means that I'm going around talking to uh, politicians, to civil servants, to interest organizations, to NGOs, academics, whoever want to talk to us about um, all the, the issues they may, might have around uh, Meta or Facebook. Um, I've been here for four years now. And before that, I worked in politics many years and also in Google at some point. Um, so a bit back and forth between tech and politics and, and that whole area. I think that's it. Excellent. Brilliant. So you've had your five uh, workshops, uh, participation decision making, number one. Number two, rights and rule of law. Number three was democratic infrastructure and tech platforms. Number four was access to democracy online. And number five, disinformation and hate speech. Speech. And my game plan is that we take gru two groups at a time. Each presenter has two minutes, and I mean two minutes, so I brought my red card, and I also brought my whistle. <laughs> it's a bit, a bit, doesn't, doesn't work as good as it used to. I actually gave this uh, red card once when it looked really nice to the uh, deputy foreign minister of Russia, and then he gave me a green card back. Uh, one I couldn't use. Anyway, so we'll try to use, try to be as disciplined as follows, as, as, as possible, also because we have, as we explained earlier, we have the Danish Minister of Foreign Affairs coming, so we have to be ready by two o'clock, so we can also ask him some uh, tough questions on the overall development of, of democracy, global level, European level, and what he thinks that also we should do more uh, from a Danish perspective. So let's get started with the two, uh, the two first groups. So group one and two for your pitch. So basically, let's see up here participation in decision making and rights and rule of law. <laughs> Woo! And we have a microphone here. Are we coming up? Are we coming here? Oh, just come up, then people can see you better. So how do you want to? How do you want us to do that? Do you want to? Okay, I'll go ahead. Cool. Um, so we were talking about participation in decision making and we were wondering what is participation and it's basically came down to engaging in the community um, in, the, in the lowest level. And we were thinking that this should be um, starting with what we, heard, uh, what we talked about earlier, um, digital literacy. So we learn about how to use the public spheres that we have. Um, and we were talking about how does digital um, 
that does the digital sphere come in there? Um, and we so uh, found out two major points. One is um, a positive point, everyone can participate. And that's also the same um, on the negative side. Everyone can participate and there is no such a thing as rules. There's not really a mandatory thing and what we have maybe that you can um, come to later that um, organizations such as Facebook um, or whoever we have there as well, I don't know, they own everything. Um, <laughs> so uh, they have um, different interests than the people that are debating um, because what we talked about earlier, we have the echo chambers, we have um, situations where people th just always think that they're right. So we were thinking that we would need to create um, a way how people can debate from really early on. So like give kids already a chance to learn how to behave in debates, how to learn how that to give space, to take space, to um, listen carefully what people are saying, but also to um, s have a way how on how to convey your points. Um, so we were thinking that there should be some sort of um, transparency um, on how kids are taught um, to be raised in a digital world, in a, in a world where they um, participate and in a world where they are um, responsible for their own community that they live in. And I think that was what we agreed on. Yeah. Perfect. Tuck. Woo! <laughs> so... So just to clarify, so, so your proposal is, I mean, to have education with regards to digital literacy? Yeah, exactly. At the national level, EU level, who, who, who does this? Who, who should act on this proposal? So the, the, the point was that we were saying it's really hard sometimes to uh, formulate things on the European level so that everybody hears it. Mm? But we need everybody to hear it. We need everybody to be aware of what we're talking about. And a lot of the times, the things that concern me are in my regional um, yeah, sphere, community. So it would be that schools come from like regional um, teaching situations where they learn how to engage um, in the internet without um, overstepping personal boundaries or without uh, making a, making the conversation inconstructive. Good. Hold that thought. We move on. Yep. Next group. So it was about uh, rules and right of law. Yep. And uh, we tend to talk that this is a lot about privilege. Uh, and that the rights are not always making for everybody, or not, yeah, that not everybody has access to it, or has the same access to democracy. So our big point um, was to make more representation in democracy for everybody who can be here or represented, uh, to also have more education, and educate or you can act in politics, or you vote, uh, or politics does work in your country because a lot of people don't know, and young people. And um, also to make it more accessible, that uh, you think about the people who are not really in the system, but still participating, for example, people who don't have papers and stuff, to make a system while voting where, for example, voting will be mandatory, and that people who don't have paper still have a chance to vote and ask for their votes because they are still living in your country, so they are still participating about the system. And also that countries should be more accountable uh, to keep their human rights uh, on point. And I think that was it. Kind of. So just to be 100% sure that I understood, so voting should be mandatory? That was a point we talked about. Yeah. So, and what happens if you don't, if you don't vote? We didn't get to that. <laughs> but I think with education, and if you uh, learn to people how to vote, how does it work, and why is it important, yeah. I think it will push more people to do it. Yeah. Maybe they will not. Yeah. Well, there are um, a number of countries that have mandatory, uh, yeah. a mandatory system also, I mean, for the election to the European mm -hmm. Parliament, for instance. So, so it's, but your proposal would then be, I mean, that this should be something that we agree on in in the European Union as such, uh, obviously also the various member states, that this should be put into the constitution, you should create a law basically where, where, you, where you have that as, as, the, as your rule. 
Ja, yeah. I think that should be a great idea. Ja, yeah. good. Perfect. So uh, two very uh, clear ideas, proposals. Who would like to start uh, with regards to... Let's start with the uh, digital literacy. Now we've put all the microphones over there. Of course. Yeah. You just keep it here. All right. Uh, maybe I'll start then. This is kind of X-Factor-like. Yeah, it's yeah, very, exactly. You, know, you, you got the so, concept. So, yeah. so, so, so thank you for, for the, the presentation so very much. And uh, to, to, to begin with this whole participation, Area I like that very much. Um, so, so for me to see you talk about this as, uh, as 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 a problem with several factors, right? There is one one point about knowledge, and knowledge about the digital world, um, and then there are, there are also a second part of rules and rule keeping. Who is in charge of uh, of also you know punishing people for not following the rules? Um, and and those are two two very important uh, uh, um, problems to to underline. Starting with the first, the digital literacy um, is is extremely uh, important for. How do you know if you are being manipulated with in the digital world if you do not know where to find true facts in a way, right? I don't, I'm, I'm not here to define what true truth is, um, but but I, I can say that in here without being uh, called anything bad. Um, so so digital literacy. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm curious. Um, is it also possible to uh, ask questions? Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious too if you are also talking about um, uh, where this literacy or where this uh, knowledge creation should 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 be. Is it a a European question that should be equal in all European countries, or is it very national, very different in, from different, different national states? Is it the same in Belgium as in Denmark, would you say? I mean, I don't think we really touched upon that, but I would say that it should be, like, the discussion take a lot of place in English nowadays, right? So, like, mm. a lot of different people come together and talk to each other, and we have to ask the European question, like, where are we going together? And do we want to go together, right? Um, and I think that would also, uh, if we touch upon this in the European connection, we would also see that maybe we, would, we wouldn't be there in the situation where we are with France right now, that they were like, maybe less Europe would be better. Because if everybody knows how to talk to each other, then we also figure out a way how to cooperate better. So I think it would be really, really nice to have it on a European level. Yeah, so that's the, the first question. The second question is, uh, so when we talk digital literacy, we commonly talk about young people should know more. We also heard uh, in, the, in an earlier uh, uh, panel that uh, young people should know more about the digital world. But did you talk about that? So, so, so who should we target with this knowledge? Is it mostly young people or is it everyone? I mean, we were thinking that schools are mainly the places where education takes place. So that would be a suitable place. But obviously we have a different democracy in the country. Um, uh, the yeah, well, democracy. Yeah, that was the word. Sorry. Um, so basically, we have uh, people that are not grown up with social media. They are not grown up with it, and I think that it's also like a lot of the time it's the targets of misinformation. It's elderly people because they are just new to this. They don't have any um, point where they can be like, okay, I know how to distinguish good from bad. Um, they're just like it's written, and we know that written things are real. Um, so I mm. think it should be, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to target anyone who's old. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> um, um, no, but it's, uh, it's really much so that there should probably be like some sort of workshops or like some like seminars. There is really good ways on like to reach everyone if you try hard enough, I think. And I think that the European Union has the tools mm. um, so that everyone gets with the same kind of like, grip to a, to a conversation because, you know, on Facebook there is a lot of discussions between people that escalate really easily. Mm. Good. Should we move on to, yeah, to sure. Martin? And sure. you're still on and to the topic digital literacy? One, uh, I, the, the reason why I use my phone here is actually <laughs> I'm putting down notes, so it's not because I'm, uh, ah, yeah. I, it's not because <laughs> I'm, I'm texting someone. Uh, um, okay. Actually, I think the last point here on the elderly versus the young are mm. actually quite interesting. I mean, uh, what we can see in our numbers is that uh, actually the, the, the worst uh, group in terms of sharing fake news is actually the elderly. 
And, uh, and I would also say that I actually have more faith in the youth in this room than I would have in my old mom in terms of <laughs> uh, believing stuff and just sharing it. So, uh, so it's quite interesting. So there is like, definitely a good point there in terms of uh, also trying to get to them somehow. But going back to the youth, I think it's, uh, I agree that I think that's super important. I think it's, uh, I think for years, I think we should have many years ago really put it into the public school systems across mm. Europe really. And I think it's, a, it's coming gradually in some countries, also here, very slowly, but it's coming a little bit. But I think it's, it's, it's actually strange when we've all been living with our phones and our platforms uh, as everyday use for hours and hours for 10 years or even more. And it's very strange that we are not only now sort of trying to get it in there, where it's, uh, I mean, we've, it's been pretty obvious that, this has, uh, that, that, that these platforms and this uh, whole digital has a, a very big grab on our life. So, so I totally agree with this, and I think we should put it into public schools. Uh, and I, uh, yeah, so I think it will come, but it's, it's going uh, quite slow, I think. So you're saying? Final point on this, yeah? Uh, just that I would suggest that uh, young people uh, teach elderly people about the digital yeah. world. Um, and I, I actually think that the, that it's a common misconception that that young people do not know anything about the digital world. Yeah. Young people are the ones that knows the most. Uh, they know specific stuff about specific uh, uh, platforms and specific terms, but they know the most. So of course they should be the ones leading uh, teaching other people uh, uh, in our society. Yeah. Good. And a warm welcome to M number three. I already introduced you, Morten Løgård, member of the European Parliament, the new group. So. Basically, this was an, another sort of concrete sort of idea that you can sort of think about, sort of the idea about the, you, the young people teaching elderly people. I think the definition of young people is really, like, it really depends where you draw the line. I mean, I agree, yeah. Depends where you start. But that's what you have to work on of then for, for in, in your, in, when you have to type it into the, in, into the plat on, onto the yeah, platform. Of um, let's move on to, and there I think you should also maybe... One challenge we've seen, if I may interrupt, uh, sorry, but one challenge we've seen is actually uh, that some young people are getting, uh, I mean, some of the elderly uh, t sort of tough debaters are sometimes scaring away the young people from the, uh, from the debate on some of our platforms. That's why nobody's on Facebook anymore. Yeah, well, <laughs> there may, might be many reasons for that. <laughs> Nobody is... is Nobody is... Wow. Well. <laughs> His mom is still on Facebook. <laughs> we just heard that. Yeah, I wouldn't allow my mom to use that. Facebook. Facebook. I would not do that. <laughs> but okay. I think we, we, we've had the, that's a long discussion. But anyway, I think, but I think you're right in the sense that there are uh, quite a lot of young people that are not there, and they're moving to other platforms. And I think actually on the, some of those other platforms, we actually have less. You have a lot of good good things in those platforms, of course, like Instagram. We have all, but 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 you don't have the same kind of debate. I mean, uh, as the like in, in TikTok, uh, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, you don't have the same kind of debate as you do on Facebook. Then you can love or hate Facebook, whatever you want. But on the sort of democratic side, I think actually I'm old school. I'm pretty old, as you can see. But I'm. I think there is more debate there and more sort of uh, politics, news, whatever. In that. But can I ask one question? Can I ask? Uh, no, question? sorry, because okay. we have to move on. Otherwise, okay. we end I'll up ask you later. time. time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You put, we just have to. We have uh, basically a few minutes left, all to discuss obviously the second proposal, which was mandatory voting. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan, uh, unfortunately, because I think that's a big part of of choosing to vote. Uh, so if what is a vote if you if you are you're pressured if you do not know what you want to do but you, then you have to i would say that it's it's actually for me quite important that it's not uh, in uh, my, my my definition would be from from denmark right that it's quite important that you have the possibility of not voting as kind of saying to the system that you don't want to participate in that so so but that's just my 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 point of view yeah oh sorry you want to uh, maybe uh, uh, just to say that we went to this point because we actually see the opposite. That is actually sometimes very hard for people to vote, and it uh, help more the uh, difference between people because some people who don't have day off when you need to vote and you need to choose it. Sometimes then also always the same people who can vote and making it mandatory can make a system to make it accessible actually for everybody. And I guess that when something is mandatory, it's Always a bit tricky, but I think it could help more than make problems. I, I totally agree with you on making it extremely accessible. So we need to throw out buses and bring people to these places, but I do not think it can be a demand. Um, because we need to find a punishment then for not 
for not voting. Um, and I think it's, it, it's in a free country, you need to also to, to, be, to be able to express your uh, point of view by not voting. But exp I'm, I'm very much uh, uh, ag agree with you in the, the whole accessibility point. So to make it more accessible, what would you I'm, like I to I think I'm very much in, in the same place. I think it, I agree with you. It's very sad to see in some countries how low the, the percentage is of, of people who actually vote. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a big shame, of course. And, uh, and if, if there are structural things that stops people from voting that those should definitely be targeted but uh, i'm not a, i'm not a fan of the of the mandatory voting i have to say okay but there is but you agree also that one should try to make it more accessible to vote and there are, there could be some barriers here that one would have to then uh, confront yeah yeah good and there might also be a, a rule for the eu to sort of say okay so are there some maybe they already do that i don't know but that if in some countries uh, there are some structures that uh, makes it more difficult to vote, uh, they could you could from the EU side say, okay, maybe you should take a look at those, put some pressure on. I think. Good, excellent. <laughs> there are two first groups. Brilliant. Now we move on to the uh, next two groups. So democratic infrastructure. Let's see democratic. How does democratic infrastructure looks like? Uh, Wonderful, Mr. Democratic Infrastructure. And uh, Mr. or Mrs. Access to Democracy. Access to Democracy, yes, brilliant. Woo! You, yeah. Two minutes. Yes, uh, hi everyone, uh, is, that, is that on? Yeah. Um, we were, our group was talking about the di uh, democracy infrastructures in the technological world and uh, what that could mean. We're coming from a place, I think, fundamentally that um, in today we all here at least um, use the social media and the digital world um, in just about everything we do. Um, it's, uh, we can all agree that it's almost becoming more than a privilege, um, more than um, you know, a service that we can use, but it's becoming a fundamental right, a right to um, have a place in society, a right to have a voice, a right to debate. Um, and so um, in talking about uh, how we can um, you know, provide this right to everybody, we want to, um, sorry, providing the right to everybody, um, we want to make sure that we're also upholding um, the core pillars of democracy um, as we define the infrastructure of democracy being um, free speech and access to information. Access to information being, um, you know, not just the information that um, we seek out in terms of news, but also the information about how our data is being handled, how our privacy is being managed. Um, at the moment, it does exist. You can find it. Um, you can manage it as well. It just takes a whole lot of time, and um, there is a big knowledge gap between managing how we, um, between knowing how to manage it um, in a lot of places. Um, this is something I think the DSA is uh, discussing at the moment um, for allowing minors, uh, making the terms and conditions uh, understandable um, for minors. Uh, we wanted to build on that and really try and develop that outside of the, the, the EU as well. Um, you know, systems like infographics um, and short summaries that highlight to us how our data is being used um, and also where it's going to end up with this kind of a vague idea of the third party user. Um, and so uh, building, yes, as I said, building um, the access of the information, how to manage it. Um, thank you. Woo! So basically privacy rules. I mean, that's, that's, your, that's your core pitch. Yes, let's move on. Yeah. Uh, we talked about um, how we can facilitate um, a democratic um, discourse on the internet and which roadblocks are in the way uh, for us to uh, get, get there. And we identified two problems which we tried to find a solution for, which uh, firstly is the lack of knowledge uh, on data collection and algorithmic mediation of content. Mm -hmm. um, and the second one being um, the democratically harmful algorithms that polarize and weaken democratic debate by limiting um, nuance. And uh, the first solution uh, for the first problem we uh, tried to uh, we found was a, a gradual digi a digital education starting early on in uh, primary school. Mm -hmm. And then the second solution we uh, found was um, establishment of algorithmic standards for democracy enforced by the EU through uh, economic penalties. 
Ooh. Could you say, a, you have a minute left, could you say a bit more about your, the final part of your proposal? Uh, the one about economic penalties? Yeah. Yeah, uh, which, um, well, the first uh, part was about um, um, getting people to know um, that there is uh, some sort of trap in echo chambers and which is uh, harmful mm -hmm. for democracy, where the second part is trying to figure out um, to remove the trap and um, figure out a system where uh, algorithms don't um, uh, get uh, uh, polarize people, but uh, create a social media system which helps people um, uh, get different points of views and um, uh, gives, gets, gives more nuance to your Instagram or Facebook feed or whatever. Good. Brilliant. <laughs> so... Who would like to start? Okay, good. Uh, amazing, thank you so much for that. That was uh, brilliant. Uh, I would like to, you know, because I, I, I heard it also as you were saying, both participation is a right, and you were also saying information is a right, as I heard it, right? Uh, uh, and, and then you talked about this, uh, the terms and conditions that the DSA wants to make, the terms and conditions, these uh, conditions we all press yes to when we are on these mm -hmm. platforms, right? The, that the DSA wants to make these understandable for children, and I'm like, maybe we should also make them understandable for all, all people. Uh, because <laughs> I don't know if any one of you have ever read uh, the terms and conditions of, of Martin's uh, workplace, uh, because I think not, none of us have. Um, and actually, I would like to use this, because in, in Critique Digital, we call this for the, su the pseudo-consent. Because everyone says yes, but no one knows what they are saying yes to. Mm -hmm. No one knows, but you know how many people say yes to things they read and how many people say yes to things they don't read. Does Facebook have numbers on how many people actually, you know, spend time on reading this? Uh, because you know how much time I use on this panda video and stuff like that, right? So, so do you also know, <laughs> do you also happen to know uh, how much, uh, how, how, how many people actually read terms and conditions? I, well, I have no idea, uh, but I agree with your analysis that it's probably very few, but I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> Maybe you can find out. Yeah. <laughs> so, your sort of main res your your main response was there to the uh, to the first proposal, right? Yeah, but that's the one we're still discussing privacy. What what was your sort of reaction to it? Uh, well, I think uh, uh, I'm just putting up a look at my notes here again. Uh, there's something about also about uh, like uh, access for info, something about infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then privacy. Yeah. Is that yeah. correct? So basically that's, you know, the way that we define the um, infra democratic infrastructures is um, not just the freedom of expression, which is kind of the topic of debate in a mm. lot of the time, but it's also the access to information. Um, and I made the point between the information that we seek out in terms of news, but also this information um, of what's being done with the data, whether or not, like, okay, yeah. young or old, I guess. Mm. Of course. Okay, yeah, good. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I, think, uh, I think things are moving that way. I mm. think, uh, I mean, uh, GDPR, the, the, the privacy rules, they did some of the work, uh, for good or for worse, but, but they moved us forward on that. I think uh, also us as a big company, we were sort of had to do a lot of stuff there, and that, that I think that makes sense. And I think more is coming, or more is coming now with the DSA, but also other pieces of legislation. And I think that makes sense. And I also think, uh, I mean, for someone like us, uh, and for the whole digital, um, actually the whole digital area uh, arena, I think it makes sense to have stricter rules around this. I mean, as long as we have uh, a well-defined. Uh, um, uh, playing field, I think that's actually fair for us. Then we know where, how to how to work, uh, and then we'll make that work. I mean, of, of course, there will be some things we don't like and that we think goes too far. I think some of the proposals that have been up in the discussion recently on DSA and DMA, etc., we don't like. Uh, others we do like, but it's a it's a so. But so it's a long. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm saying a little bit yes and no here. But I th but that's also how it is. I mean, uh, in overall, I think it makes sense to have more frameworks around the, someone like us. Yeah. Uh, so in principle, yes. In principle, yeah. yes. And then the detail. The devil is always in the details, sure. of course. And more than have uh, probably had our my colleagues uh, knocking at his door 25 times, complaining about stuff. And you too. You yeah. know what? <laughs> and also me. <laughs> you You've too. been there as well. You have the floor, Morten. 
Yeah, but but I think just to follow up on what what Martin said, and sorry for being late. I mean, the planners have to, my planners have to realize that this is post COVID nineteen. I mean, we have to we are meeting we are meeting physically now, so we we have to spend time on parking and stuff stuff like that. Oh, sorry, <laughs> that was the reason. Anyway, coming back to your point, Martin. I mean, uh, we have had several meetings you and I about this uh, because and and the and the point being that that you guys also want to be regulated. Yeah. You asked us to mm. regulate you because you have seen uh, many years ago that this would be uh, this would be cha cha very chaotic, and we would end up in a situation that no one likes if we didn't do something. So now, let's get to the details because that's that is really the, the hard part of it. We are pr in principle we are, we are, we agree that we need some kind of regulation. So the good news is that. And I might bring you some news here. Uh, I talked to the, the chief negotiator on the DSA yesterday, and she said that today mm -hmm. they might find a solution, an agreement on, on the DSA. So it's quite of hot news, actually. And one of the points in this, one of the, the, the struggling points uh, lately has been the algorithms. The, the mm -hmm. questions about algorithms, and we have been discussing this too, because as politicians, we said, well, if you really want to be regulated in a way that we understand, the audience, the politicians, the uh, the public, you need to allow us to get some insights on your algorithms. Otherwise, we can discuss day and night and 24-7, but if we don't get some kind of idea what's going on behind the scene, well, we can be, we, we, we don't, we wouldn't have achieved anything. That goes somewhat to the discussion about the, the, the terms and conditions, because they are all about the, 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 the naughty details when you're a lawyer. So, uh, what, what's up? I think that, that we can, we can uh, foresee that some kind of regulation on how to use the algorithms mm -hmm. will be there. So that's, so that's, that's the, the second proposal. Yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's the yeah. good news. Yeah. How will it be? Well, difficult to know, but I think uh, we don't quite get what we want as politicians and you as a public, but what we do get is some kind of uh, acknowledgement and some kind of uh, you know, duty for you guys to come up with some explanations, some assessments on how these algorithms work. This, so uh, we, we might look into a regime whereby you will deliver on a yearly basis, on a six month basis, some kind of assessment on how things are moving with, with, with the consequences of your algorithms. Yeah. So that you don't deliver your secrets, but you will much more thoroughly go into the consequences and deliver some you know, ideas on, and if these consequences are severe enough, you will have to change these algorithms. This is, this would, I think, would be part of the compromise. And here we also had a proposal of sanctions. Do you want to comment on that? <laughs> on, on economic sanctions for, I have to get that repeated, for, for doing what? For not pre uh, securing data uh, enough? No, we uh, talked about algorithms, uh, and we wanted to uh, enforce or um, uh, create a seal of approval for different types of al algorithms for different uh, companies, which uh, are done by an independent organization made by the European Union. And if you don't comply to those um, standards, you then um, get some kind of, uh, you are incentivized to comply to these standards. I think it's... And, uh, so we'll set up some kind of an agency for, algor for algorithms in within the European Union, which will then have to standardize. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay, now we get it. And you don't live up to the rules, then you get economic sanctions. I think yeah. it's a brilliant idea. Uh, mostly because of the money is the way things work in this uh, business, I'm sure Martin will agree. And, and uh, um, <laughs> um, so, 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 uh, so transparency is also what I hear, right? But one thing is uh, transparency about algorithms. But, but if I was shown the algorithm of Facebook, I would be like, I don't know what this is. This has some code. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not a programmer, so I need that institution to translate it to me, right? And to, to compare it to, to, to your com competitors. Um, and also, I would, I would say that when we talk about algorithms in, in, in this uh, broad term, uh, we need to specify in the details, because for me, uh, the algorithms, algorithms you have, one algorithm is, you know, 
what makes the, the newsfeed and Facebook look like it does. But a specific part of this algorithm is also creating what we call, as the critics of Facebook call, shadow banning, which is a, a, a term we have talked about before. And, and yesterday, I actually, I, I, I read a, a, a long uh, op-ed in, in Berlingske, two pages long, uh, 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 you know, directed at you for, for doing shadow banning. And shadow banning is, is a concept where uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram can turn down the lights on content that it does not, you know, in a way follow the rules of Facebook. It is not deleted, but they turn down the light on it. And 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 that that mm -hmm. when you when you post content like that, you are not, you know, you don't get a notification. You are not being notified that this happens to you. Um, so and and it, it can also, you know. Um, uh, influence uh, content that you will present afterwards. So if you one time are being, you know, punished with shadow banning, it can also be, you know, be a, some, be a little prescient for you. And Martin, Martin nods, and I, I would like to hear your, your comment afterwards. So one part of this algorithm is also an automatic response if you write something about sexual uh, education. Mm. That word includes the word sex. And that is a word Facebook doesn't like. So, so automatically, this shadow banning is being uh, uh, used, and for me, the transparency and why this is a great idea comes because we need to know about that. I need to know as a citizen on which subjects do you shadow ban and how much, and, and maybe should people also know when you do it. Perfect. But uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I think, uh, well, I think. Should I, we have I, a, an agency? That's the yeah, I think, uh, what we What we will standards. probably need is something like what Morten talked about, Con mm. uh, uh, where you get an analysis of what's the consequences of the algorithms. Because, as you're also saying, seeing an algorithm or algorithms are like a piece of code that uh, gets you from A to B on uh, if you want to go to B or C or whatever you want to go. And I mean, I mean that's, uh, that's not really, but what you want to see is what actually happens with this uh, machinery. Uh, so you want to see the consequences and the analysis of that. And I think that, that makes sense. I don't know, I'm not sure how you, the how the idea is to actually sort of set it up in practical terms, yeah. but I mean, getting that kind of uh, more, more oversight into that, I think is coming, and it makes sense to have more. Also, because the algorithms today, I, we talk about it always as if it's something uh, bad or evil or something, or uh, mysterious. Uh, but the thing is that it's actually, we, we're using algorithms for a lot of stuff, many different algorithms, and like, for instance, p f fighting misinfo on our platforms, where we do turn down the traffic for some piece of information that we suspect are uh, fake news, for instance. And then we use algorithms to do that. When they pick up on certain signals, they turn down the traffic to that kind of content. We do it on uh, things that we feel are uh, clickbait or, 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 or different kinds of scams. Uh, if we uh, suspect it's that because our algorithms picks up on it, then we have an algorithm that says, okay, looks, this, this looks fishy, we'll turn down the traffic mm -hmm. for this. And that's, uh, so you're right in the sense that we do that and, uh, and we use algorithms for it. And one more final, th and I'll stop. Mm -hmm. And that is, that we are, but we've also sort of seen the debate and heard the pressure. And that means that right now we have also reintroduced on Instagram, for instance, that you can actually kill their algorithm. You mm -hmm. can just uh, turn it off and have, and, and do, you, do you set up your feed in a different way. On Facebook, you have actually for a long time been able to kill their algorithm when you go in there. And you can choose most recent. If you choose most recent, you will see post in a chronological order and uh, no algorithm. But that, I can't recommend it. And it will, uh, but uh, because you get all kinds of crap, if I'm allowed to say that. But uh, but you can do it if you don't. If you're afraid of the algorithm, just kill it. Uh, that's how it can goes to. Can you see sort of yeah, well, some kind of agency being set up on this particular issue? Yeah, I can actually, okay. uh, and I think that we we can call it many different names. Yeah, yeah, whatever. But but uh, but what is needed, and what and, and and I guess you're right here. We need some kind of organization that can deal with this. Yeah, because who's going and to this? And this is so. I, I let let me just predict this. I think we will end up there. We will, we will end with some kind of uh, organization taking mm. care of this because this is too important to 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 just let go and just you know go on like nothing has happened and have some piece of legislation which is to some people understandable to some others not understandable and for sure some will not implement it anyway and then we are back in the old hmm. you know track which is uh, killing the european uh, union as such because the lack of implementation 
well, there's a completely different uh, mm. discussion, but mm. very important. Mm. So, but what is needed, and the reason we have all these agencies, which some people criticize, I don't understand it, because they have, actually many of them are very well functioning. Uh, we need it because the important things uh, have to have some kind of European uh, building. Mm. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, if we talk about... Uh, we talk about the cyber crime, mm. uh, cyber offense. We have a, an agency for that. It's in Athens, Greece, oh, yeah. uh, but but we have it, and uh, several hundred people, uh, experts, are actually hired hired in uh, to to deal with the uh, the overall cyber crime situation seen from a European point of view. It's very very good uh, and well functioning uh, organization led by a, a Finn, by the way, and and. Uh, and uh, we need that kind of organization also when it comes to algorithms, if you ask me. Mm, yeah, I was asking you. Excellent, brilliant. So uh, we just uh, agreed upon an, an agency, <laughs> or at least some kind of an organization to deal with, with this particular topic. So well done. Let's move on to the final group, disinformation and hate speech. How do we deal with that? So uh, we talk about uh, so uh, this information and um, and uh, what was the other one? Eight speech. Yes. And um, so <laughs> we talk about that um, in the past. The gatekeeper of the information was like the media, like television, and they was choosing like which subject we should talk about and stuff like this. But now with the social media, the gatekeeper uh, of about the information change, and it's mostly us. Like we influence like the information by giving attention to some things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something we should be aware about. What where do we put our intention? Like on some like hate speech or stuff. It just give it's pray more if we give it attention. Uh, one of our thing we wanted is like uh, it the. Um, not being possible to be anonymous on social media, like that, um, every, because um, when you speak to somebody on social media, it's you're speaking to somebody, and uh, if you if you do something wrong, it needs consequence. So it should be we should be able to see who do stuff. So like not being anonymous could be in possibility is that there is consequence if you do something bad. So like it came to the thing that. If something is illegal in life, it should be illegal also in uh, in the like internet world. Yep. So um, we think that we need uh, stricter rules, like a consequence if something happens on the internet. That it should be like uh, more because now, usually, if you do like something like hate speech or stuff, it's like there is not really consequence, and we want that it uh, happen what, more often. And what kind of consequences do you want? For example, like uh, bullying somebody on uh, mm -hmm. like yeah. internet, it's uh, it's illegal to bully somebody, and uh, so like consequence. Uh, I don't know exactly what he, it is, but if you do in real life, you have consequence. So yeah. it should be the same. And um, another thing, good. we we oh. yeah no okay so, twenty seconds uh, good yeah, another come. thing is like uh, we often said that us our generation is like expert of uh, social media and stuff. Not completely true. Like we born with it, but it's not for that. That when you are like tw 13 years old, you know like how to use social media in a go good way for you. So that's more like what we talk about. And it's it's all world now that we're gonna have kids that we should like watch what our kids are doing on uh, social media because it's like it's you are very vulnerable on a social on social media internet and you can do a lot of stuff and maybe not good for your age. Good, thank you. But, but Martin, to a certain extent, isn't this the DSA that you just spoke about earlier? Yes, it is. And, and I think that the, I mean, uh, the well, starting which, point of this discussion is right. And, 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 and the, the ideas that you came up with is to some extent already built into this uh, discussion. Uh, it's not that, um, I mean, the, the principle for us as politicians, and most of us at least, is that things that are illegal uh, in the physical world, of course, also need to be illegal mm. uh, in the digital world. So that is, so, so, so far, so good. The, uh, as always, 
coming back to the details is and the how, devil, yeah. yeah, and the devil, what to do when you're when you're dealing with the, with the the actors, the platforms, the the, the places where I think these things are actually taking place, and and uh, now um, only not to complicate things, but I see in in the physical world, it's also an ongoing debate what needs to be illegal and not. Uh, so it's not that it's only reserved for di the digital world what is mm. what is uh, illegal or not. So it's an ongoing discussion both in the physical and the digital world. But in principle, yes, we are trying to do the same things and then we run into a lot of, of different problems, especially with data, since uh, this is all mostly about data and, and how to, uh, how to, uh, to deal with data. Uh, this complicates things a little, but in principle, yes, and we are actually doing that or already now uh, in the DSA, taking care of these things. And are the consequences then severe enough, so to speak? Uh, no, not at all. Okay, actually, yeah, I would say, say I would say that uh, that right now we are, we have beautiful beautiful rules on the GDPR uh, data regulation. They are you know beautiful a beautiful piece of paper, but it's not being followed, uh, and there are no punishment. Uh, of course, the, the rules say you can have a very severe punishment, mm. very big uh, fines, but oh, the, it's, it's, not, it's not the case right now. So for one, one thing, we need, we need to actually have true punishment uh, uh, when you actually don't uh, obey, uh, obey the law. That's the, the one part I very much agree with you. Can, can I just... Uh, so that's DSA part two then, or what? Yeah. Yeah, yeah but can I just comment on that? Yeah. Because I think the GDPR example is, is quite good. I... I mentioned it before and I would like to, to repeat it because this is m might be one of the most uh, serious discussions that we need to have about how things work legally in, in, in the Union. Uh, we make all this beautiful uh, legislation and we do really do. Uh, I've been part of the, yeah. of the Internal Market Committee for 12 years and I, I'm sh I can assure you we did a lot of beautiful legislation. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the problem being that w whenever it, it has to be implemented in the member states, things always go wrong. And th this, is, this is just the, the way of the world. Why is that? That goes to the heart of the question of being a union because we do set up this uh, legislation, we agree on it, and when the member states have to implement, they don't do anything. And that's very, you know, hard to say, but in Denmark we do. We are always uh, the, 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 good, the good pupil in the class. We always do things and then we put another 10% on the top of it, so we have a lot of discussions on on just how silly things are coming from the Brussels. But anyway, the, 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 the different problem is in, the, in, in many other states, you don't implement at all. In Spain, just ask what is GDPR in Spain, and they will say, well, that's about Pedro, he's, he's working at the, you know, down at the, in the basement, and he's, uh, uh, you know, they are not even trying to implement the GDPR. So what is the problem here? The problem is that when it comes to implementation, we don't have a union. We have 27 different member states doing exactly what they like to do when the, the legislation hit, hit the national border. So that is a good discussion, I can tell you. Sounds that is like uh, the dream of Marine Le Pen, the union of free hands. Yeah. We already have yeah, that. Exactly. All. No, sorry. Have you asked the, the Danish commissioner, um, Margrethe Vestager, about this? She will say that probably the most... Uh, Sincere, the, 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 most, the, the, the most severe problem for her as a legislator is implementation. implementation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, well, just on the, on the implementation. DSA 2.0. I mean, I, I would. Uh, I mean, GDPR or whatever kind of uh, rules. I mean, a company like us with the size we have, we have to follow all the rules. I mean. No, because I mean we are That's under such wise. scrutiny. Everyone is uh, looking at whatever we do and and shout at us. So I mean we can't sort of uh, cheat. I mean that would be very dangerous. Uh, so I think it's actually uh, so for someone like us it would be great if everyone actually started following the rules. <laughs> uh, but um, besides that, there was a few things here I think was interesting on uh, on the on the uh, yeah I'll, I can't take too much time so I'll, I'll i'll start with the anonymous anonymous thing one of your yeah. proposals were about anonymous yeah uh, that you should not be able to be that yeah. i think i understand that and like on for instance on facebook we have a real name policy so that people will have to be who they say they are when they go into facebook and they and if you can and we can report fake uh, uh, fake accounts and you can take them down etc but if we then take that step one step further and actually ask for id per, personal id and say, okay, so we want to have 100% uh, 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 certainty around who you are. 
I, that's that has some advantages, but I think the the back uh, the bad side of that is that uh, if, for instance, if you could do that in all countries, then uh, you would uh, the 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 um, the government and authorities would always know 100% certain they would be on who has just expressed what, and that means in a country like Russia, for instance, where where you <laughs> if you said something about uh, Putin or his war, they would be knocking on your door like five uh, seconds later. And that's uh, maybe less uh, less great. So that's why we, have, as a as a global company, has a we don't really like that system of one of sort of uh, personal identification uh, behind every account. Um, yeah. So, but we do understand the problem of we uh, we, we if we do f remove fake accounts and all that. Yeah. So that but that's a it's a tricky one for mm. us actually. Uh, and then one more thing, maybe just on the uh, you also touch on the question I think of, of age gating. Uh, you said that something about um, how young people uh, are maybe too young to be online, mm -hmm. etc. And that's a tricky one also because, uh, I mean, we all, I think all the platforms have a, like a 13-year-old boundary saying below 13 you shouldn't be there because it's a grown-up platform. Uh, but, um, but in reality, lots of kids are there on all the platforms, mm -hmm. also ours, of course. And uh, well, maybe not Facebook, I heard, but uh, on the others. <laughs> it's only your mom. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she's all alone there. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that's a tricky one because I mean uh, they just lie about their age, and parents actually know they're lying around their age. Their school teacher know they're lying about their age. They all do. They have like in Denmark, all the kids on age 11, thir 12, 13, they are all on uh, TikTok, on Snapchat, and on Instagram. Those three platforms, all of them, pretty much. And uh, and uh, I mean, and all their parents probably know it. All their teachers probably know it. And uh, and I mean, if we wanted to stop it, we it's probably not because it's probably not us that could really stop it. It's probably me as a parent that could stop my daughter from doing it. Mm. But I'm apparently not. I'm not, me and all the all the parents are not doing it. So that's another discussion. But just to say that the, the, I think the answer is actually with the with ourselves as people and parents. And yeah. get the final two minutes. So, uh, so also just to have ju just a, a look out in the future, for, because now, right now, we have experienced for maybe four years ago, we experienced the first uh, a term of the digital evolution, I would say. Everyone was technologically uh, optimistic, everyone loved Facebook, and Facebook was the good guys, and then you actually, then, then you were employed. Uh, at, yeah, in, in 2018. Uh, no, but but then we we arrived in the second term, the second term where everyone were praising regulation and law, and now we need to you know yeah, yeah. punish, uh, and we, we need to to uh, national states need to punish, but also the EU need to punish in the world, and uh, and I'm like so. so the, the the exciting thing is to try to understand this, the third term mm. because. National states are making their own rules. EU are making their own rules. Mm, yeah, Facebook yeah. are making, uh, uh, you know, you are making this oversight committee board where, uh, where you, you can have your, if you have, you have uh, a, a piece of content you have posted. Uh, if you don't agree with that, you can maybe, you can maybe uh, have it tried there. So, 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 so many people want to regulate now, and none of them work together, as for me to see. Not, not yet. So the, the exciting thing is to see how will you work together. Um, and, and I don't know where, but I think that's going to be the next part of this journey. Mm. Yeah, and I guess one could say that since we are dealing with a topic that is cross-border, it makes most sense that you do it at the, at the European level would be my immediate response. I mean, personally, I find it a bit sort of confusing that we should have national Danish legislation on these topics and then have an EU uh, legislation on top of it. But that's, that's maybe just me. Anyway, I think uh, that was it. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you to Mikkel, Martin and Morten. So basically following the M principle, We'll just uh, shift a bit around and hope that the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs will arrive. Otherwise, we just continue debating Ukraine and democracy and Fukuyama and various other stuff. No, no, you, I'm sure we fine. Let's give them a big hand. Just <laughs> 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 <So super. laughs> <laughs> 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 I hope there will come else. No, it's good. Vi skal lige have nogle borgerne.
We're just about to start again. Jeg skal være sikker på, at det her det er et rent glas her. Right, I think we should just uh, get started. Somebody could please close the door over there so we get... Yes. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to have the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Denmark with us here Kofo. We are extremely grateful that you have taken the time here because your calendar and your workload must be absolutely horrific. You still look okay, I have to say. Um, so we truly appreciate it. Uh, we started out this morning, just to fill you in, mm -hmm. uh, where I uh, sort of quoted uh, Francis Fukuyama and his sort of rather optimistic sort of uh, point of view that uh, something good could still come out of the tragedy in Ukraine in a sense that we are ex have all experienced a, a wake-up call, that we do no longer take democracy for granted, that we have the spirit of uh, 89 suddenly sort of coming back. That was a positive scenario. Uh, he also has a more gloomy one, I must say, uh, when, I, when I checked this last night. He calls it his ultimate nightmare scenario. And that's the situation where Russia and China team up together in the war in Ukraine, possibly also in Taiwan. And I quote him now, if that were to happen and would be successful, then you would really be living in a world that was being dominated by these non-democratic powers. If the US and the rest of the West couldn't stop that from happening, then that really is the end of history or the end of the end quote unquote. Mm. No, you've prepared a speech <coughs> for us and comments, but maybe at a certain stage, uh, either during your speech or during question time, you could also reflect on these rather two different <laughs> scenarios, the optimistic one, that something good could come out of this, and then the, the gloomy nah, scenario, nightmare scenario, this could actually lead to the end of the end. The floor is yours, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lukke, uh, and I really feel tempted now to go directly into that debate, <laughs> but I think uh, it would be great if I first give my speech and then we'll take uh, the discussion exactly. afterwards. But uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's uh, almost Friday afternoon. It's, uh, I'm great to see you here. Um, it's good to see you all, and especially also to see so many young people being involved in this debate. I think it's really, really important. It's about your future, about our future. Um, I uh, also uh, hope that um, the discussion on, that we will have now will, will be part of forming a real debate over how we can take part in politics because that is really needed. Uh, I'm very committed to the discussion with all of you. Um, and remember, in politics, those who engage and make an effort have the biggest say in how we can solve the challenges. So there's also active call on participation here. I've taken, many, um, I've taken part in many debates about Europe and our common future. And in these debates, I feel a huge commitment from young people like you, especially within two very central themes. The first theme is climate. Climate change is one of our biggest challenges. It threatens our planet uh, and our very existence. We already feel the effect of climate change today, but it will only get worse if we do not move further, faster, in a greener direction as soon as possible. Denmark plays a key role here. We have a special responsibility to get the EU and the rest of the world involved in our ambition uh, when it comes to green transition. The second theme is tech, which you have I understand debated today, and I would like to put a few more words uh, also on that. You know, tech plays a big part of uh, my everyday life, your everyday life, and probably all of others' everyday life. That is why we must ensure that we, in a way, control technology and not the other way around. There are many great benefits from new technologies, 
but they are also increasingly being misused by autocratic governments in the world. Most recently, we have seen it in connection with the war in Ukraine. Social media like Facebook, YouTube and TikTok have been used to sp spread false information and to fertilize the ground for Russia's uh, invasion. But technology is also being misused in everyday life to spread hatred, to offend and to bully. We must find solution to this. At the same time, the technology the companies have become large, rich and powerful, and that is why we need to ensure that these companies take responsibility and contribute to our society. And we must also insist that they follow our democratic rules. For example, we need more transparency in the algorithm behind social media, which boosts one type of posting and hide others. This requires a close European cooperation, and Denmark is actively working to develop a digital foreign policy for the EU. We want to ensure that European values have a greater place in the design of global digital rules. Denmark has a strong experience as a front-runner country in the field, and we are often asked for advice. We have formulated a strategy for a more responsible, democratic and secure future with technology. And with the Tech for Democracy initiative, Denmark has taken another important step. The initiative brings countries, civil society and tech companies together in a new partnership. This way, technology can support democracy and human rights instead of undermining it. In addition, Denmark has taken the initiative to increase support for civil society and democratic institutions in developing countries. In this way, we support democracies around the world in a new digital and geopolitical era. But Denmark cannot fulfill these great ambitions alone. It is crucial that we work with like-minded countries, civil society, technology companies, and not least, NATO and the EU. Values, security, climate, tech, these are all important elements when we discuss the European Union. And I ask you today, who do we want to be in the EU? What do we want uh, in the EU? And how do we think the EU should address the challenges we face? Since I became a foreign minister, it has been important for me to get as many young people engaged in this debate as possible. It is uh, your future, as I said, and it is absolutely crucial that you help uh, defining it. That is why I would like to thank also NUT Europa for organizing the event of today. 2022 is in many ways a very special occasion to discuss European cooperation. Well, it's 50 years ago the Danes voted yes to become part of the European cooperation and that we have to celebrate, remember. I was not alive. Voting at least. <laughs> uh, I was not alive either and not voting uh, for the same reason like you. Uh, and since 1972, Denmark has uh, left uh, its clear mark on the EU and we must continue to do so, not least at a time when our common values and security are under pressure. Because we are under pressure. We have to realize that. Russia has invaded Ukraine. Right now we are experiencing the greatest challenge to peace in Europe for decades. Actually, the war we are seeing, we have not seen that type of war since Second World War. And who of you, and I included, believe that we in the beginning of 2022 will be in a situation where there is war in Europe to that scale again. That's really um, unbelievable and something which should make us all think hard about how we defend our values um, and our as our democratic values. I never thought that your generation would experience such a threat, but this is now the reality. It is, however, reassuring to see how united Europe and also the West, including US, Canada, UK, but also Japan, Singapore, um, New Zealand, Australia, even Switzerland, um, which is a neutral, used to be a neutral country, how we are united defending our values 
in the face of Russian aggression. And, and how quickly uh, and clearly we also responded together. Putin's aggression has been met with historical sanctions. The EU has wholeheartedly shown its support for Ukraine and should do so and go further, in my opinion. We have gone further than ever before, also by supplying weapons to the Ukrainians that are standing up for our freedom. They are the ones who are in the front of the freedom struggle uh, in modern times in Europe today. And they are doing that struggle not only on behalf of the Ukrainians, but actually on behalf of all of us in this room, and we have to recognize that. What we're witnessing today will undoubtedly shape our policy for a long time to come. I'm sure that the, the future will be, we'll be talking about a Europe before uh, February 24th and after February 24th of 2022. Our response to the crisis is clear. Europe must take greater responsibility for its own security and Denmark will need to be part of that. So today, Denmark is the only country in the EU that cannot fully participate in the EU's cooperation on security and defense. It is not doable and we need to change that. Time demands unity, not reservation. Times also demand collaboration, not solitude. Therefore, I believe that Denmark must abolish the defense opt-out. Only by doing that, we can fully participate and lift our shared responsibility. I think it's our obligation. We all have to ask ourselves in the, in the face of Russian aggression and the security challenges in Europe, what are we each and every country doing to stand up for our values? And one of the answers to Denmark is we are investing heavily in our NATO alliance, but also that we'll get rid of the opt-out and participate fully in the EU Security and Defense Corporation. Um, so we need to get rid of the opt-out. And um, it's also important for, for me to say that this is something where we should do that united as a, as a country. Um, we will um, also see that greater security for Danish uh, families and companies if we get rid of the opt-out. This will give us an opportunity to decide ourselves also when we can and will participate uh, and not participate in our common yeah, EU operations. And it will give Denmark a greater say in the developing, uh, development happening right now in Europe. And that is why we asked the Danes on the 1st of June, should Denmark be involved in deciding what Europe's future security should look like? Question mark. Should Denmark be involved in taking responsibility? Question mark. My answer is yes, we should. We should take that responsibility on us. And I will urge all of you and all of your friends to go down and vote. It's a democratic, not only right, but I think obligation. And that is, this is why it's a very important decision we are taking, not only for Denmark, for, for, but for your future, for our future. So, um, let me thank you for your time today and thank you for engaging in the debate. I also hope that some of you will continue this debate and join me at the IBIS uh, Dialogue a debate event I will host on Monday, the 25th of April, because I, I sense in, in your eyes that you all want to have more EU debate, so please come on Monday. Um, here we will uh, dive further into the question of the new security policy situation in Europe and what it means for the defense opt-out. The debate and the decision is about our lives, our future, our values, and I think it's so important that we take an open, honest, and enlightened debate in a democratic spirit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs> when you sat under pressure, I just had to check that song. It was by Queen, so maybe next time you come, we'll have Queen well, sort of under pressure, under pressure song <laughs> sort of in the, on the stereo. Just for the, uh, think about your questions, just for the non-Danes, uh, 
The referendum that the minister spoke about is because Denmark, 30 years ago, at that time we could vote, uh, voted no to the Maastricht Treaty, so in 92, as the first country ever in the European Union. And uh, then we had to fix that somehow, was the solution by Danish politicians. And then we voted a second time, and we got the so-called four opt-outs. And one of the opt-outs is on defense. And that is the one now that the government decided to, to put uh, to a referendum on, on the 1st of June. So. Who would like to be the first to, to ask a, a question to the minister? Let's see. Shh. And why do you think then you can answer my question about Fukuyama? What's your nightmare scenario? Oh, well, I'll, I'll, that's what I said in the beginning, <laughs> Luke, that I wanted to discuss that question. Uh, and I think, um, well, he's absolutely right in a nightmare scenario where autocrats, autocratic governments, autocratic ideas, uh, autocratic views on the world, uh, if that takes over and in a way um, um, undermine and also uh, redo our whole global system of norms, values that we built after the Second World War, which is anchored mm. in the United Nations, in our conventions, uh, where each and every country has obligations also to human rights, to, uh, to, to live peaceably side by side, this is a nightmare. Mm. But I, I, when, you, when you spoke about Francis Fukuyama, I, I recall uh, an interview I read about, uh, he, he gave recently, mm? where he actually said that he was a little bit misunderstood mm? Mm? when he said that after the end of the Cold War, there was the only, you know, the end of history, only democracy, a liberal market economy left, and nothing else will happen than joy and, and peace and, mm. and uh, happiness. Actually, he Champagne for everyone. Yeah. He actually, he, he, I think he actually said, no, he thinks that of course there can be setbacks first. Mm. And the, the development in, in the world historically is not a, like a, a linear development. It goes sometimes back and sometimes it's a quantum jump, mm. like we saw in 89 with the fall mm. of the mm. Berlin Wall mm. in November mm. or 91 mm. when the Soviet Union broke down. But he also realized, and I agree that that being living in a, in a so-called liberal world doesn't mean that we should abolish national, um, nationality or sovereignty or countries or, or peoples, mm. uh, because that's part of defining who we are. You are in Denmark, you are in a society that generations before me developed because they believe in, in a welfare state, in democratic values, in, in, a, in a vibrant civil society. It defines our society, so the respect over different peoples uh, is important part of an enlightened world. So there could be all type of, of democracies uh, respecting the same fundamental views. And I think there, you know, in globalization, we saw that, unfortunately, that um, some of the forces in globalization, in a way, is trying to destroy the uniqueness of uh, nationality and societies. Mm -hmm the positive ones, mm. the patriotic ones, not the nationalistic ones. And I think that's where he is right. I think we should uh, recognize that we all belong to, to communities. Uh, we all are part of that and we have obligations and rights because we belong to uh, communities. Um, we belong in a Europe, EU, in a strong value-based community. Read Article 2 in the European Treaty mm. and you will see what it's about. And that's also why I think, uh, and it's important for Denmark, that we stand up against the ones who try to undermine the value community we are. Um, that's why Denmark also has been criticizing Hungary and Poland, for example, when fundamental rule of law or values are being questioned, and we should do that. Sorry for the long no, answer. No, that's fine. But and uh, the article you referred to is on, on the front page of Weekend der in the Danish journal last, last uh, week. Yeah, Mikkel. Uh, yes, hello, and thank you for the, the speech. Uh, my name is Mikkel. My question is regarding those values, because I would say that both in Denmark and in EU, freedom of speech is a value, and access to information is a value, right? So I'm curious about your point of view on, on this situation where the European Union has now censored or deleted Russia Today and Sputnik TV, two major Russian uh, uh, media outlets, uh, state-controlled, uh, but R Russian uh, uh, media outlets. Um, if you try to Google them now, you cannot find them. They have been deleted. 
I, did, I, don't, I don't know if you know, they have that power, but they can, you know, just delete them. So you cannot find Russia today. So, so how does that, you know, how is that possible in, in a world where we, by following these values, try to live in a world of free speech? How is it possible? What's your point of view on that? Very good question, and, and it, it uh, has uh, obviously clear dilemmas. Mm. That I want to underestimate. The dilemma is, okay, we are Russia, we have become uh, autocracy, I would even use a stronger term if it was not public, um, but it's become an autocracy. We have media outlets, two uh, in particular, Russia Today, uh, for example, um, that is controlled by Kremlin and are spreading lies about uh, the war in Ukraine, are spreading hatred, are undermining truths and objective facts, uh, using as a propaganda mean for an aggressive state that has violated all principles, also in the UN Charter, that when it has invaded uh, unprovoked and illegally a uh, neighboring country, Ukraine. What should we do? Should we let them, because we believe in free speech, to uh, use, uh, to have a license to do propaganda, undermine um, our society, democratic societies with lies? Or should we say, no, as long as this war is going on, Kremlin and Russia should not have this channel to spread false lies? I think it's, it's right, the last part, because we have to realize that we have to protect our democracies. We have to protect democracy itself. Um, but I recognize that it's a balance. And it's not all, for example, Russian media that are Banned. It's two particular media that are used by Kremlin as a, as a mean to destroy, I would say, free democratic debate over what is happening in Ukraine. Um, and, and it's not about two like-minded like states. I mean, Russia today is not a democracy. Europe, Ukraine is a democracy that has been attacked. And they have the right to protect themselves. We have the obligation to support Ukraine in protecting themselves. And one of the means, besides weapons and money and humanitarian aid, is also to protect themselves against using lies, um, like Russia Today and Sputnik is spreading, to undermine the Ukrainian state as part of the invasion. So in that context, I think it's justified. But I recognize in other contexts, I would be against it because I'm a firmly believer in free speech. Uh, but here, I think uh, the line has been drawn correctly. Clear answer. Yes, all the way to the back. Please state your name. Yeah, and maybe where you come from. Thank you. Yeah, my name is, my name is Anna. I'm from Denmark. Um, but my question is: you you mentioned in your speech how uh, the Europe and America and Canada and Australia and all these countries are are together against um, Russia. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, later on, you mentioned uh, Hungary and Poland and. Uh, French are having elections on Sunday where Le Pen might get elected, Trump might be re-elected as well. So just from a, a foreign minister point of view, um, what do we do about this? Like have, yeah, what, what do we do about it when, when suddenly we're not maybe as united as we used to be? What do you do about it? Yes, I'd like well, to hear that. <laughs> well, what I do about it, uh, yeah. well, it, it does many questions here, but, but let me say, <laughs> I'm firmly believe in democracy. So at the end of the day, it's the people in each and every country that it will elect who will be the leader of the country. If France elect uh, Marine Le Pen, they elect Marine Le Pen. Uh, if they elect Macron, they elect Macron. And we have to respect the outcome of an election. But what uh, if they but, elect? But, but uh, then uh, Lücke is asking, because that's <laughs> what you mentioned, Hungary and yeah. Poland. <laughs> uh, and there, that's why I'm so much against the undermining of the rule of law and, and, and European values in Hungary. Because is there something like free media left in Hungary? Question mark. Is there free universities left in Hungary? Question mark. Mm. Um, so if you look at the election there recently, and you look at also the observation from outside, yeah, they might have done in, you know, in technical term at the election day a, a, a perfect election. But if you look at the whole context in which the election is taking part, it's not, um, it's not being gone, done, done in the right way. Uh, that's why we criticize it, because where are the free media, for example? And for me, 
democratic societies is both about rules, about how you conduct things, elections, but also about, in a way, culture, how you create a society where you allow opposition, where you allow free media, where you allow criticism, and that's where democracy uh, comes uh, to its right. And there, there are challenges, autocratic challenges, in Europe itself, and that we have to fight back. Um, and you ask about the U.S. Um, I recall what happened uh, at the you know, U.S. Capitol Hill was attacked mm -hmm. a little more than a year ago uh, by, I would say, um, forces that are enemies of the democratic values and democracy itself. And that we have to also fight. But I believe fighting it is to enlighten people, to discuss, to engage. There's no other way. But I also believe that even though we will see setbacks, we will, in countries, uh, in the longer run, I am a firm optimist that democracy will prevail. Uh, because just look at what happened with Ukraine. Putin heavily underestimated two things. First, the unity of the West or the democratic world that we come together. Secondly, our ability to impose sanctions to a scale that Russia has not anticipated. But also, we would just say, even deliver weapons to Ukraine on a scale that was not anticipated. So, so yes, we, the world is, uh, at the moment, in a terrible state. Uh, geopolitics is back. But the democratic values that we and you and Luke yeah. and I, my generation, has taken for, too much for granted. We have. Uh, and now we see what is going on in Ukraine. It's a, it's a brutal wake-up call for all of us, that we could not take democratic values for, for granted. I hope that will animate all of us, your generation, to go out and fight even harder for democracy. Uh, I think they will. Even in countries in Russia today where democracy are suppressed, there are people who still, despite the harsh laws that the Duma and Putin has imposed, are demonstrating, or even though they're thrown to prison. Mm. So I really believe in the longer term we will prevail, but we will have setbacks and we have to deal with them uh, it could be uh, in the US, it could be other places, but then we just need to deal with them. That's also why we need a stronger Europe, by the way. It, it's, it's important that we, as uh, democratic countries, uh, stay together. Um, and I actually feel, remember, that all of these sanctions we have imposed so far in unity, that is really good, despite uh, that the sanctions effect on each and every European country, it's very different, it's asymmetric. Some countries are uh, much more affected by the negative impact of sanctions than others. Despite that, we see that we, all 27 member states, has adopted sanctions and we should continue to do so. And Denmark will fight for the hardest sanctions against Ukraine as we can agree on. And they all agreed this morning that have a gas-free weekend if that could help Ukraine. Mm. We have time for very, very, very quick two questions and very, very, very quick two answers. First, yes, please, you wanted to have the floor, yeah? Yes. Hello? Short question, yeah. Uh, my name is Nikolai and I'm from Denmark. And I would like to ask the question that our strategy towards uh, Russia uh, since the Cold War was to kind of like bind us together economically to prevent war in, in that kind of sense. And now we actually see that that has been kind of like they're using it against us now, right? So oil prices are rising, gas prices are rising, and we're actually financing their war, right? So my question is, after this war, should we adopt a new strategy, kind of like isolate Russia and create a new Cold War? Or is it more like we're just going, gonna, uh, is, it, is, is this a time for a, for a shift of strategy towards Russia and... Yep. That sounded a bit like what happened to the Handel durch Wandel uh, strategy in Germany. Does that need to change? Should yeah, I yeah. <laughs> Should I take it? Uh, okay. Just your okay. final, final, final question. Yes, please, here. Um, yes, um, Linda from Germany. And um, I was wondering, because um, now the debate um, also about defense is turning about um, Sweden and Finland joining mm -hmm. the NATO. And I was just wondering, because we don't really, we're not really concerned so much about this in Germany, but the question is, you probably spend a lot of time thinking about this and talking about it as you were in the same uh, geographical zone. So I was wondering, um, where do you stand there and do you support it or 
are you against it? First question on whether we should change our strategy towards Russia. Yes, <laughs> the short answer. <laughs> There's a really, I mean, listen, um, we, we all saw the indications of, of Russia becoming more and more authoritarian, more and more expansionistic when it comes to their policy abroad, but also their policy at home. Uh, look at the Duma election in, uh, in last fall. Mm. Uh, OSCE has, for the first time, given up to observe the election yeah. because it was not a fair election, for example. Look at what happened in Georgia in 2008. Look what happened in Ukraine in 2014. This war that is fighting now began in 2014 when they, uh, they occupied and annexed uh, Krim, uh, Crimea uh, Peninsula, but also eastern Ukraine. So, so we have seen all of the indications, but the speed in the last... A uh, few months is very scary how fast a society can become very authoritarian in Russia. And that calls for a total change of our Russia policy. And that is something Denmark is fighting for. We should isolate politically uh, Russia under Putin and his regime. We should make the um, cost of the war as high as possible by imposing the most far-reaching sanctions we can get, also putting energy on the table. We should provide weapons to the Ukrainians, so Russia will also uh, experience severe casualties on the battleground because that also is hurting Russia because they have an illegal, unprovoked uh, war going on in Ukraine. On all aspects, we should be as strong as, as possible and as united as possible. So yes, a new Russia policy. And then, do you support Sweden and Finland become members of NATO? I support each and every country in Europe's right to decide themselves whether they want to apply for membership of NATO or the European Union, for that matter. And it's only, it's only um, the responsibility of, for example, Sweden and Finland and the 30 NATO countries to decide whether they're going to be members of NATO. In principle, I am in favor of each country who is seeking membership and, uh, and fulfilling the requirements that they can join. But it's a decision of that country. Uh, and I respect that there's a debate going on in Finland and Sweden. And when they conclude, uh, I would be happy to see the outcome. Uh, if they join, we'll have a situation with all five Nordic countries, Iceland, Norway, Denmark, Finland and Sweden, being member of NATO. So we will have the Nordic Defense Corporation in another way than was well, I, what I'm referring to is historically Denmark and Norway, we became part of NATO all the way back from the foundation in uh, 1949, where at the time uh, Sweden and Finland had chosen another course. But now what Putin made us is to come together, which is, not, I think, not the outcome he would like, have liked to see. So I think that is, in a way, very good depending on the referendum on the 1st of June, because otherwise you have still Denmark not be able to participate with the other Nordic countries in the European defence dimension, because even Norway can participate there. That's why we have but think tanks like yours to well, explain <laughs> yeah, the yeah, Danish well. anyway, people anyway, anyway, why anyway. it is important this that we This sums up uh, our discussion. Yeah. Respect for your time. Thank you very much. Oh, we you. truly appreciate it. Let's give the minister a big hand. And... Um, Hopefully you can have a bit of a weekend, even though there is a French election. So, Julie, you like to sum this up, and you also have some uh, information about the uh, European folk high school in Denmark and in Spain and so forth. Floor yes. Yours. I don't think I will sum it up. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I think you've do. done very well, uh, Luca, as well, and, and you all know what you, you have been discussing. But what I wanted uh, just to do uh, before we end, first of all, Thank you, Luke, for 